So yeah, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Um, thank you for the nice introduction, Andy. Um, it's great to be here. I was, was thinking that, you know, this is actually my first time actually being at one of Lighthouse LA services. I've, I've been over here in the gym during Shepherd's conferences before to come up when we have kind of banquets during one of the nights, but I've never actually been to one of your services before. So it's kind of kind of funny that for the first service that I've been here, I'm actually preaching to you. Uh, kind of funny, but um, yeah, but again, it's great to be here. <clears throat> and uh, I was also thinking that, you know, it's kind of intimidating because Pastor John, like founder of basically Lighthouse, right? Started the San Diego church, went up, started the San Jose church. Now is down in uh, you know, Los Angeles, started this church. Um, one of the founders of the church. And then I'm following on the heels of last week, one of the other founders of the church, Peter Lim. And so big shoes to fill for sure. Um, so yeah, I, I, I pray that I, I um, the Lord speaks through me and, and uh, that you guys are encouraged and edified through it. So so yeah, my, uh, I'm married. This is my, my beautiful wife here, Christy, and my son, JD, up here in the front. Um, hey there. <laughs> um, we've been married 29 years. Uh, we met in college when we were both 21, and there's, a, there's kind of a whole story behind that that she likes to embarrass me with, but um, we won't go there. You can ask her about that stuff later if you want. Um, Jane and, <laughs> Jane and uh, Josh heard about it a little bit last night. We were staying with them before we came over. Uh, JD's 11. Um, he goes by John Daniels, his real name, kind of our, 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 his full name. Uh, we named him after my favorite New Testament character, my favorite Old Testament character, um, other than Jesus, of course. So JD, he goes by JD, and we adopted him, um, obviously, when he was only 24 hours old. So very, very young. And he came home, he came home uh, I think, at 48 hours old. He was in our house. So um, it was just such a blessing to have him here. And you'll probably hear more about that later as part of the sermon. Uh, we're originally from Texas, and we've lived out here for a long, long time. We've lived out here essentially our entire marriage. Just under uh, 29 years, we've lived out here. So um, we've basically are Californians now. We've, we've lived more in California than we ever lived in Texas, but I grew up in a really, really large town about the size of San Diego. I, I came from San Antonio, Texas, and Christy is from a really small town up in Northern Texas called Denison, Texas. So you can probably tell from our accents. I really don't have a Texas accent. She's got a heavy Texas accent. And I think it's just a small town, large town kind of dynamic there. But yeah, we've been down at the Lighthouse San Diego for about 11 years. Um, actually just over 11 years, and I'm currently serving as one of the leaders down there. I'm actually one of the, I'm the newest elder um, at the church down there. And what I do for a living, um, kind of unique. I'm a marine and aquatic biologist, and uh, I work for an environmental consulting firm down there. Uh, basically, I get paid to scuba dive and go hiking. So really cool job. I just love to be on the outdoors and you know, swimming around, looking at fish and bugs and stuff like that. But essentially I do water quality. So I go out and I survey these streams and these rivers and these lakes. And occasionally I get out into the ocean and do some work out there, looking at the biology to see what's there. And the biology can really tell you a lot about what the water quality is like, All right? So I'll get more, I'm actually gonna talk a little bit about that as part of the sermon here today. But if you can't believe it, actually at one point when I was going through college, I actually probably could have considered myself an atheist. You know, I, I going through college, I was a biology major, ecology major. I had to take anthropology. I had to take um, evolution classes. I had to take, you know, all of these uh, biology, ecology, and stuff like that. All of them saying that there's no God, no God at all, right? Everything can be explained through naturalistic processes. So I was basically won over by that side of things. And I'd say, you know, probably by the end of the time college, yeah, I would have considered, I didn't, I wasn't like one of these outspoken, you know, angry atheists out there. I was just kind of living my life, lived, but basically there wasn't a God, right? But God really got a hold of me. He got a hold of me. And I'm glad that I now, looking back on it, I'm glad that I went through that point in my life because now, you know, I have that background and I can actually speak that language. So when I encounter somebody who is along those lines, I can actually speak to them on, about it, you know, from both sides now. So I'm just really, you know, glad that God kind of brought me through, through those times. So let's, uh, if, you, if you're able, if you might stand, we're going to read the passage that we're going to be going through today. You don't have to stand if you don't want to, but um, we'll stand and, and read our passage today. It's going to be 1 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 1. And we're going to be reading the entire passage. Our, our theme passage today is actually 1 Corinthians 1.10. We're going to be going through the whole verse in context of uh, 1 through 17, though. And I'm reading from the, the New King James. So I've just had this Bible forever, and I, I can't give it up. It's got all my notes and stuff in it. So <laughs> most of our church has gone over to the ESV or the NASB at this point, but I'm kind of still stuck in the New King James. So anyway, here we go. 1 Corinthians 1, uh, 
1 through 17. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him, in all utterance, in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come so that sorry so that you come short in no gift eagerly waiting for the revelation of our lord jesus christ who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our lord jesus christ god is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son jesus christ our lord now i plead with you brethren by the name of our lord jesus christ that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those in Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am Paul, I am Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides that, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Let's pray. Lord, please let these words that we speak today, the words that we hear from your word, penetrate our hearts. Lord, you are almighty. You are sovereign over all things. We love you, Lord. We pray that your word would separate us, separate our heart, that we would just be pierced, be convicted, Lord, through your word, that we would know, Lord, that you have brought us to yourself through your son, Jesus, and that we are all of one body in Christ. Please be with us today, Lord. May this service be of honor to you and be a blessing to those who hear. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. Okay, so I think the slides are up there. Can you guys see the slides okay up there? Okay, so now if you're taking notes today, I'm only gonna have two points, so let's keep this pretty simple, okay? Uh, the first one is gonna be from verses one to nine. It's the Corinthians' position, their position. And then in <clears throat> verses 10 to 7, we're going to look at the problem with their practice, the problem with their practice in verses 10 to 17. So again, looking back at our, at our theme verse today, uh, verse 10, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, I could probably just start and stop right there, right? I feel like Paul is really fairly unambiguous with what he's trying to say here, and his language should be convicting enough for us to read it and do it, right? Let there be no divisions among you. And that's, all, that's actually how a lot of my counseling goes, right? Just read the Bible, or here's the verse, and do it, okay? Stop doing what you're doing, do what the Bible says, right? But you know, if we did that with this verse, it would be a super short sermon, right? Just read the verse. Okay, guys. Amen. Go on your way. No, it's not like that would be the sort of sh shortest sermon ever. And maybe some of you are okay with short sermons, but no, not here at Lighthouse. That's not the way it goes here at Lighthouse. I've sat through many of Pastor John's sermon in the older days, and I, let's just say I can relate to Eutychus, okay? Now, if you don't get that joke, one, you should read your Bible more, and two, go back and look at Acts 20. <laughs> Um, so we're, you know, we're living in, in kind of a weird time. We're living in a very weird time. There's the war in Ukraine. There's crazy inflation. 
uh, people getting canceled for some innocuous thing they said, uh, biological men competing in women's sports, people tearing down statues of our nation's founding fathers, citizen confidence in our nation's institutions is at an all-time low. And there are many other things like this that I could mention. You know, I've heard it that we're living through the spicy times because it causes heartburn, right? We're living in the spicy times. Um, I'd say right now we're probably kind of in the habanero territory, but probably by the time that the 2024 elections come around, we'll have moved on to ghost pepper at that point. But it's getting pretty spicy out there, right? Um, I don't know. We'll see what happens. But, <clears throat> but there, if there's one thing that's definitely true, there appears to be more divisiveness now than there's ever been at any time in our nation's history, with the possible exceptions of the Vietnam era and maybe the Civil War going way back then. But at least back then, we could agree on what a woman was. And we could agree that we don't need to announce our pronouns, you know, that kind of stuff. But we're just becoming more and more polarized as a society. Um, and it seems like that if one side disagrees with the other side on anything, they're immediately vilified and they're called out for being evil haters of what's good. You know, it seems that this has even really trickled down to the neighborhood level where some neighborhoods become divided over some, you know, some divisive issue at the point where some neighbors won't even speak to other neighbors. It's crazy. I mean, we've, Christian and I have personally lived and gone through two former churches before Lighthouse where division was a real issue. And at one of the churches, it caused it to split. I was really too young and too new in the faith at that point to really know what was going on. But, you know, being new, I had a lot of growth and maturing to do. But one thing I did know, this was not a good look for the church. And I really think that it's human nature to want to classify, divide, exclude, criticize, you know, set up your own camp with our people and think that somehow we're in the right and anyone who doesn't agree with us is in the wrong camp. And this is what Paul was really dealing with in our text today. So while 1 Corinthians 1.10 is going to be our central theme verse, we're going to go through the entire context of 1 to 17, because I think it provides a lot of background of what Paul was really trying to drive at here. You know, as I'm sure you're aware, and you would have to be being in a church taught by John and Andy, the Corinthian church had some real issues. You know, Paul had received word that there was some conflict in the church going on there. And not just some disagreement over the color of the carpet or like what they're going to have for, for dinner at the members meeting or something like that. No, they had, the members had actually taken sides and align themselves with certain teachers. And so basically the, the whole book of 1 Corinthians has to do with correcting various errors in the, in the Corinthian church. That's why for, for those of you who went through the ballast class down in San Diego, is anybody here that went through the ballast class down in San Diego? Maybe remotely. Um, well, anyway, what's the, what's the um, one thing about the, the theme for 1 Corinthians? The overall theme of 1 Corinthians is what? It's correction. The whole book is about correction. Okay, there are so many issues within the, the Corinthian church. Chapters one to four is all about just general disunity. Chapter five, tolerating immorality within the church. Chapter six, Christians suing each other. Chapter seven, errors around marriage and singleness. Chapters eight to 10, errors around Christian liberties. Chapter 11, errors around the taking of communion. And then of course, chapters 12 to 14, spiritual gifts was a big issue in the church there. And then chapter 15, errors concerning the resurrection. But Paul, out of all of these issues that Paul was addressing in, in this letter, the one that he sees fit to address first, the one he wants to hit right out of the gate, out of all these other issues that they had to deal with, and an issue of prime importance to Paul, was unity in the church. In fact, disunity in their case. And this is the point that he really wants to drive home first. So Paul had actually founded this church. He knew the people there, and he had a fatherly concern for this church. Over in chapter 3, he states that he had planted this church, and that when, when he did so, he had to give them milk and not solid food because they weren't ready to really receive the heavy things of the church yet. This was a young church. And in addition to this, this church was in an area of the known world at that time that was a major crossroads for trade. So if you wouldn't mind going to the first slide there, there should be a map <clears throat> that shows up. Tell me when you guys can see it because I, I can't see it from back here. Yeah. Okay. So you can see where ancient Corinth was. This is the first one is just a map of the whole Mediterranean. You can see there's a dot on there that says ancient Corinth. I don't know if you can see it from that far away. There's a little black dot. That's Greece, okay? Corinth is right there. If you go on to the next slide, I kind of zoom in. Now, Corinth was 
in a very unique position in that part of the world. Corinth was located on the Isthmus of Corinth. It's this narrow stretch of land that joins the Peloponnese, which is that large kind of island looking thing off the coast with mainland Greece. And if not for this small stretch of land, it actually would be an island. And it's roughly halfway between the major cities of Athens and Sparta. So Corinth was kind of right in the middle. So everyone who's coming off of that area of the Peloponnese had to go through that small isthmus. They had to go through Corinth to get to the mainland of Greece. So if you can imagine all the various worldviews, the religions, the cultures, the viewpoints, they all were flowing through that town. Again, Paul understood all of this, and he had some real concerns for that church. He was seeing some fractions happening in that church. With all those cultures coming together, there's potential for real conflict. And Paul saw that this was happening in the church there. He understood that the spirit, through the spirit, once conflict enters the church, that the testimony of that church is weakened. The shining light that it should be in that clash of cultures in that dark place becomes dim. It becomes vulnerable to attack by Satan, and ultimately that church may not last. Jesus alludes to this a little bit when he's, um, he alludes to the vision when he's being attacked by the religious leaders for casting out demons, and they attribute his power to Satan. And Jesus responds to the religious leaders by saying this. He says in Mark chapter 3, he says, how can this be? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not stand. And so it is with the church. If we are divided as a church, if factions develop within the church, that church may not stand. So in these first 17 verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and you can go on to the, to the last slide, by the way. Um, <clears throat> so in these first 17 verses, Paul uses a familiar formula that we see in many other letters that he writes. And that is, first of reminding them of their position in Christ, and then he moves on to how they should use that position as a foundation for how they are to live as Christians. In short, as Christians, your practice should match your position. And in the context of this section, if you take nothing else away from the sermon, it's this, because I like to, just in case you start to doze off later, I like to put the main point kind of up front, right, for those of you who are taking notes. Because we as believers are in Christ, joined together with every other brother and sister in the body of Christ, the church, there should be a sense of unity, oneness, and like-mindedness as each part of the body supports, helps, and encourages all of the others. I, think, I believe that's what Kevin Say preached on a few weeks ago out of First Thessalonians, that we are to support, help, and encourage one another. So let's look at verse 1 and see how Paul begins this letter to the Corinthians. Verse 1 in chapter 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. So he starts off this letter, as he does many of his other letters, by stating that what has become almost a title for him, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And while in other contexts he uses this a bit differently, I believe here in this case, He's using it as a statement of authority. He's playing the apostle card, if you will. You know, actually in 2 Corinthians, if you remember what's going on in 2 Corinthians, Paul actually has to come to a defense of his own apostleship because the religious leaders and the false teachers there were questioning his motives. So he actually had to start defending himself as an apostle. But I believe here in this context, it's here to show some measure of authority that he was appointed by the will of God because he is about to write them a letter of rebuke, a letter full of things that he has identified as needing correction. He also identifies Sosthenes as being with him and assisting him. Now, while Sosthenes was a fairly common name in that area of the world at the time, um, this could actually be the same Sosthenes who was formerly a leader of the Jewish synagogue in Corinth, the Greek who the Greek Jews took out their frustrations against in Acts 18 when they beat him before the judgment seat because they didn't feel like he brought a proper case against Paul. This might be the same guy, and it's possible that that guy became a believer. And now he's supporting Paul, helping him, traveling with him. So in verse 2, he then goes on to address the letter to the church of God in Corinth. He says, 
to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So not only does he address it just to the church in general, but to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling. So here I believe he's beginning to kind of lay the groundwork, right? He's, he's laying down um, some, some, some basics for them because the rebuke is about to come, okay? He's identifying the members of that local church in Corinth as followers of Christ, as believers. And not only as believers, but those who are called and those who have been and are being sanctified. Later on, Paul in chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, he kind of expands on this because after running through a whole list of sins that characterize those who are unrighteous, he goes on to say in verse 11, and such were some of you, referring back to the sins he was all just mentioning, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. So what's he doing here? He's reminding them of their position in Christ, that you have been set free of these things. You're set free of your old self. Your sins have been washed away. They've been washed white as snow, in fact. And not only that, but he's telling them that this was not of your doing. This was something that wasn't done by you. It was something that was done to you, okay? And I think it's helpful to kind of break down the tense verbs here. The verb phrase in verse two those who are being sanctified, or those, I'm sorry, those who have been sanctified, it's in what's called a perfect passive tense. Now, I'm not a grammaticist, okay, um, but I think it's helpful here in this case. What, the, what this perfect passive tense indicates, it's a completed past act that was not performed by its recipient. In, in kind of layman's terms, it's a third party, God in this case, performing the action on someone else. Okay. And then he goes on, with the second phrase, saints by calling, saints by calling, referring to the effectual call of God, an external calling, a drawing to oneself, not something that was mustered up internally. Kind of like as Jesus indicates over in John chapter 6, verse 44, no one can come to, the, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Okay, and I'll get more into that in a minute here. But I skipped over something a little bit earlier that I purposely because I wanted to come back to it here. And that is that Paul was also called. So not just the Corinthians, Paul himself was also called. So let's look back at verse one. Paul called as an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So he brings that to the forefront in introduce, introducing himself. So while at the same time, he's introducing himself as an authority figure, He's also saying that he himself was drawn by God. Later on in 1 Corinthians, he says that he's the least of the apostles. And that at one point he says he's not even fit to be called an apostle because of his former life of imprisoning and sometimes killing Christians. And over in 1 Timothy, he calls himself the chief of sinners. But so Paul really recognizes what he states over in Romans 3.23, right? Everybody should know Romans 3.23, right? Um, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Paul recognizes this. So he's identifying himself with them, indicating that we are all, including himself in the same state, all deserving the wrath of God. And that has, and that there is nothing we can do to inherit eternal life. There's nothing that we can do. Okay, in fact, if it were up to us, we would, all of us would turn our backs on God right? Because in our former state, before God got to us, before he saved us, before he pulled us out of the miry mud that we were in, we loved our sin, right? Our sin fulfills the desires of our flesh. That's what we used to be. Think Romans 3, 10 to 18. And Terrence actually quoted a little bit of this earlier when he was uh, during the worship time. There is none that is righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There's not even one. Their throat is an open grave. Their tongues, with their tongues, they keep deceiving. 
The poison of asps is on their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their path, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. He's describing humanity here. He's describing all of us, right? Before God came and saved us. And Paul makes this perfectly clear in multiple epistles. At the beginning of Ephesians chapter two, when he's talking to the Ephesians, he states that they were all dead in their sins in which they formerly walked, dead in their sin. But then he includes himself in Ephesians two. And he says, we too formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. So he's including himself in there. Notice there's we's and us's and ours in there. But then comes the big but. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgression, he made us alive together. Notice again the, the plural pl pronouns here. He's included himself in this list. We were made. And then he goes on like this for several more verses using we and us. He says, he raised us up with him. He seated us with him. He showed his grace toward us. We are his workmanship. So Paul is identifying himself with these fellow believers. He's not saying, you know, I'm some high and mighty apostle, you know, and you guys are all the sinners out there. No, he's saying that I'm one of you. And this is who we are as well, right? This is who we are. God graciously bestowed salvation upon us through his son, Jesus Christ. We have been adopted into his family. And that is our new identity. And we're to walk in that. Now, as I mentioned earlier, being an adopted family ourselves, we adopted JD when he was 24 hours old. Um, I have a great appreciation for the adoption that we have in Christ. Um, it, it just provides such a vivid, vivid image to me. Because JD, he had nothing to do with being adopted to our family, right? He had nothing to be. He was a passive participant. There was nothing he did to deserve to be part of our family. There was nothing he could do, actually, right? He was just a helpless 24-hour-old 24 24 -old infant. But yet, he was brought into our family with the full rights of being our son. And he will always be part of our family. And that's who we are as well. We were helpless children. There was nothing that we could do to be saved. In fact, we didn't even deserve to be saved. But we were. Because of the tremendous love of the Father, as believers, we were adopted into the family of God, and we are totally dependent upon God to do that work. It's nothing that we can do. Later on in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says that we have been transformed by God. We are a new creation. The old sinful self has passed away. We are now his in Christ. So why do we keep going back to our old sin? Why do we, like the Corinthians, keep going back to our old ways when we are our, our new self. The old self has passed away. Well, I was at a job, speaking of going back to marine biology, I was doing a job down the Seal Beach National Estuary. It's actually not too far from here, over in Anaheim Bay, if you guys are familiar with where that is. We were actually, actually out there collecting things called benthic invertebrates. <laughs> They're just basically critters that live in the mud, okay? Um, to help kind of determine the overall health of the estuary, and you can actually tell quite a bit by just looking at the worms that live in the mud. You can tell the health of the estuary. One of the tasks that we had to do was to walk out on these really long, low, uh, flat mud flats at low tide, walk way out there. And we were collecting cores, take these big coring devices and shove them down to the mud, twist them and bring them up. And it brings up a big giant core of mud that you then put into a sieve, you know, wash it with water so you can separate the mud from the worms and the clams and the shrimps and everything else that live down in the mud. And depending on the types and the diversity of the bugs that live there, gives you a really good health, a really good idea of the health of the estuary. Anyway, this, this mud was soft. It was very soft. And I, I knew this going in. I, you know, I've done work on other estuaries before. So we even bought some special mud shoes. They're kind of like snowshoes, but you wear them on the mud. You, know, you strap them over your boots, right? And they're big, giant things that kind of increase the surface area so you don't sink so much. And they helped for a little while, but you know, eventually I sank in. Sometimes up to my knees, but one time I was sunk up to my waist. So 
the harder I pulled to get out, <clears throat> the deeper I sank. And just when I got like one foot kind of up out to kind of push down on it to get my other foot out, it just sank right back in again. And with the tide coming back in, it's kind of an eerie feeling to be stuck out there on a mud flat, right? The tide's coming up. And finally, I had to get my partner to come over and help pull me out, which they did. But I thought this is a really great illustration of how we take our approach to sin in our lives, right? We struggle against it. We make promises. We fight. We put up barriers. We buy mud shoes to help get us out of it. Um, but despite all our efforts, we really just sink right back into it again. You know? But in Christ, we are a new creation. We're not slaves to sin anymore. It does not have mastery over us. And that's not to say that we don't stumble sometimes, right? We do. We're still living in this fleshly body. You know, as John says over in 1 John chapter 1, if we say we do not sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. But again, we have been forgiven in Christ. We've been set free. And that is what Paul is telling the believers here in Corinth, that we are all in the same boat here, including himself. Sinners saved solely by the grace of God. And we all have a common testimony in that sense. You, me, everyone. Everyone who has been saved by God has that same testimony. But getting back to 1 Corinthians, Paul is saying, yes, I am an apostle. I do have authority in speaking the words of God, but I'm just like you, Corinthians, a wretched, a wretched sinner in need of a savior, called and adopted as one of God's children pulled out of that miry mud to be part of the unified body of Christ, the church. But not only does Paul lump himself in with the Corinthians, but in the latter half of verse two, he goes on to say, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. So not only is he saying that he is one with the Corinthian church in position before God, but he is saying that they are one with all who in every place are believers. And to put an exclamation point on this, at the end of verse two, he says, their Lord and ours. Now, we all, we all have the same Lord. We're all under his authority. We're all in the same lost condition, all saved by the same grace. I think Paul is really trying to drive home the point here that, that we as believers are all in the same family. We all have the same Lord. We're brothers and sisters with one another. He often uses the term brethren when addressing fellow believers because we've all been adopted into the same family. Christians actually are never commanded to become one with Christ. It's not a commandment. Because why? Because that's already an objective reality. That is their position. They've been placed there. Again, passive. They've been placed there by God. Unity in Christ means that all believers are in a relationship with Christ and by definition to every other believer as well. All believers are united with each other, whether they know it or not, whether they feel like it or not, you are united with every other believer. It's kind of the, um, over in Romans 12, five, he says, so we who are many are one body with Christ and individually members of one another. And again, in Ephesians 4, verses 4 to 6, there is one body and one spirit, just as you also were called into one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So Paul, I believe here, is really trying to remind these Corinthian believers that they are all one. They are brothers and sisters of one another one family, they are one in Christ. And again, he's laying the groundwork because he's prepping them, reminding them, because just here in a few different few verses later on, the admonishment is going to come. He's prepping them for that. And this should be a reminder for us as well. You know, what Paul is telling the Corinthian believers here is no different than if he had written a letter to Lighthouse Los Angeles, San Jose, Orange County, San Diego. We're all in this together. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We're one body with many members, but one head. But we certainly don't act like it sometimes, do we? 
You know, we'll get, a, we'll get more into this in a little bit, but at times we can be so petty. We can be so self-centered, thinking that the world revolves around us, right? That, that we are ultimate. Our preferences, our needs need to be met. So <clears throat> after stating his authorship and then addressing the letter to the recipients, in verse three, he gives an introductory greeting that is very common in Pauline letters. In fact, it's often how he ends his letters as well. If you look through you know, all of Pauline epistles, you see beginning to end, um, it's very, very similar. And he says this, he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the grace that has been extended, us, extended to us through Christ and the peace that we now have with the Father. This enmity, the separation from God because of our sin has been dealt with through Christ's atoning work on the cross. And so we not only have peace with God because of the atoning work, but now we also have peace from God in knowing that our, our salvation is secure in him. Like JD being adopted into our family, once you're adopted into God's family, your status is permanently there. That status is yours eternally. So the following five verses, verses four to nine, continue along this line of, of their identity in Christ. Let's look at that real quick. Verses four to nine. It says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him, in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you would come short in no gift, eagerly awaiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Did you notice anything about those verses? Anything stick out to you at all? Any pattern that you saw among the words that were used? Again, they were all passive verbs. You notice that? All but one of the verbs in those six verses was passive. I think Paul is really laying it on thick here, reminding the Corinthian believers of their position, their salvation, their justification, their sanctification is not their own. It was done to them. They had nothing to do with it, right? They had been bought with a price and were totally dependent upon the grace and mercy of God. They are in a position they are because of him, because of what he has done. It's the classic Ephesians 2, everyone should have this one memorized, right? Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. They were once slaves to sin, but now they've been set free. Yet they're not free. They're bondservants of Christ, willing slaves. And not only will he save you, but he will confirm you to the end, as it says. Similar to what it says over in Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and with great joy. Again, all passive verbs, if you notice that. Something that was done to them. He also says in these verses that they were called into fellowship with Christ Jesus, our Lord. Again, em emphasizing that commonality. Now recognize these, in these verses, there's a lot to unpack, a lot to unpack in those verses. But I also recognize that there's no way that I can go through all of that and get out of here without being frowned upon for missing lunch. So we'll just move forward. Okay, so we'll save that for, that's a whole nother sermon, just those, those verses by their own, on their own. So now we're getting to verse 10 and Paul kind of shifts his focus a little bit, okay? <clears throat> He's turning from emphasizing who they are in Christ now to how that should manifest itself in their words, their actions, and their attitudes. Before getting into, this, in, before getting into his rebuke, Paul needed to establish their common foundation, their common unity in Christ. Especially here because of the disunity that had already infiltrated this church. 
he needed to establish their common bond in Christ as the basis for calling them back into unity. Apparently, word had gotten back to Paul that there were factions developing. For he says, I exhort you, brethren, that you all agree and there be no divisions among you. In other versions, it says, I plead with you, or I urge you, or I appeal to you, or I beseech you, right? Now, this word that's used here for exhort, plead, agree, you know, all, all those different words, appeal, urge, it's all, the same, it's all the same word, and it's parakaleo in the Greek, which means to come alongside for encouragement, to come alongside for encouragement. I remember this word. I'm big on mnemonics. That's how, that's how it got me through ballast knowing mnemonics and had all these different verses. But I remember this word parakaleo because para, meaning like parallel, they're headed in the same direction, okay? And kaleo reminds me of a word cleat, which is a word that I deal with a lot because I work on boats a lot. Um, it's an attachment. A cleat is an attachment point on a dock that a boat ties up to. A boat comes up alongside the dock and ties up to it so that the boat doesn't float away. So I remember this because of parallel and tying up together, paraclete. The word that's used here is a very similar word to the, the way that the Holy Spirit is actually de uh, described also. is coming up alongside a believer, paraclete, same thing. So Paul, as a fellow believer and as a sinner, is wanting to come alongside these believers to encourage them. He had heard about these divisions from Chloe's household or someone within Chloe's household. And that there were divisions that were resulting from quarrels, arguments among the members. Also here, the division that's used in this verse, that the, let there be no divisions among you, is the word schisma in the Greek, schisma. And that's where we get our English word schism. And I believe that the, the Webster's definition, dictionary definition for this word actually does a pretty good job of describing what Paul is trying to get at here. Webster's dictionary division for a schism is a split or a deep division among strongly opposed sections or parties caused by differences of opinion. I think that's what Paul is really trying to drive, drive home here. This is what was happening. Strongly, deep divisions were, were, were forming themselves in the, in the church. And I think the key uh, word in this definition is opinion, caused by differences of opinion. Paul mentions that there were four different factions that were developing in this church. Those that were following Paul, those that were following Apollos, those that were following Cephas, which is Peter, and those who were following Christ. So as I mentioned earlier, Paul had founded this church. And then apparently at some point down the line, they had heard from Apollos and they've heard from Peter and of course, Christ. Now, Apollos was a very polished and eloquent speaker. Mighty in the scriptures, it calls him. Now, over in chapter 3, it seems as if Apollos had actually come and preached to the church in, in Corinth before. Because over in chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 of 1 Corinthians, Paul states, again, that he had planted the church, but Apollos watered it. So it seems that Apollos had been through this church and actually spent some time actually ministering to them. And it had a profound impact on the believers to the point where some were starting to follow him. And, okay, for, yeah, forget about Paul and Peter. Paul, Apollos is the guy right? Um, now, I'm not sure if, if Peter had ever visited this church before and maybe preached there before, but, you know, being one of the initial 12 apostles that had actually walked with Christ and being the current pillar of the church back in Jerusalem was probably enough to elevate his status among the believers there. And now, while they all preached Christ, I'm sure there was a fair difference in style between Paul and Apollos. You know, Paul says that he did not come with superiority of speech. He didn't come with great eloquence and wisdom, while Apollos was apparently quite the orator. So this may have been a difference of style or even maybe perceived power between the two of them. And some had gotten behind Paul as a founder of the church, while others were behind, were behind Apollos because of his great eloquence and eloquentness and persuasiveness. Then I'm sure there are others that were saying, well, you know, Peter actually walked with Christ and he talked with Christ. He outranks all you guys. And then there were the Christ followers, which sounds great, right? Ding, 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 you got it right. You're following Christ. 
Who else should we be following, right? But it's interesting that Paul says, well, that Paul mentions nothing more about this group, these Christ followers. It's very, very interesting. You might think that Paul would say, yeah, they got it right. You need to be more like them. But he doesn't. He just moves right along with his rebuke. It's possible that this Christ group are saying, <clears throat> well, you know, we follow Christ. Unless you're doing, unless you're in our group, you're, you're nothing. Christ is the way to go. So it's possible that they were appealing to their piety and having some sort of elitist attitude towards the rest of the people there. <laughs> possible. So while they had the right object of their affection, the right object of their devotion, they had the wrong outworking of it. John MacArthur actually says that it reminds him of people who say, I don't need church. I have Christ. Christ speaks to me through his word. Right? Now, while that is true, okay, they would have to disregard a whole plethora of verses which speak to fellowship and accountability of the local church. Okay? But again, Paul flies right past all of these groups, these factions, and he lays right into them saying, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? They were being divided over secondary issues. It wasn't like, you know, Paul or Apollos were teaching false gospels, and so they're going to align with one or the other. No, it was, this was preference. This was preference of style. You know, maybe Paul was more straight to the point and blunt, and maybe Apollos was more flowery with his words. But they were all preaching the same Christ and him crucified. Paul is appealing to them. Don't let these petty things divide you. You are all one in Christ. Now, it's clear that Paul doesn't care about the manner of how Christ is preached, as long as he is preached. Over in Philippians chapter 1, verse 15 and following, Paul says this, and this is him writing from prison. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill, and the latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking that to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, that Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Now, in, in many of Paul's letters, he addresses unity within the church. We see it in Corinthians, obviously. We see it in Colossians, Ephesians, Romans, Philippians, Philemon, Galatians, Thessalonians. Now, he, he's touching on unity in almost all of his letters. Obviously, he values unity within the church very highly. But he always bases this unity on our common confession in Christ. Always comes back to that. In the first few chapters of this verse that we've just been going through, it's actually a microcosm of the whole book of Ephesians. You know, as you've been going through already in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul lays out what God has done for you, for the Corinthians too. Then he goes on to say what we should do in light of that. Similar to the book of Ephesians, the whole book of Ephesians is this very format and it break down, breaks down quite nicely. Six chapters, the first three chapters are who we are in Christ, what God has done for us, our identity in Christ. Then the last three chapters are how we should live in light of what God has done for us. So it's a very, very similar format. Again, him going back to the basics, what is our identity in Christ? How should that manifest itself in our lives? Paul, and even, even in Ephesians, Paul begins the second half of this letter of how we should live it out with what? Unity. Unity is how he starts out that second. Ephesians 4, 1 to 6. Therefore, I, a prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Now, whenever you see the word therefore in scripture, you should think to yourself, what is that therefore, therefore, right? What's, it, what's he referring to? Well, whenever you hear the word therefore, it means he's referring back to what he just talked about, okay? And again here, he's basing it in Ephesians on what he's about to say on what he said prior, and that is 
our position in Christ, our identity in Christ, what God has done for the Ephesians and what he's done for us. And because of this, we are to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Through humility, through gentleness, through patience, and showing tolerance for one another in love, as it says right there in Ephesians chapter 4. Now, here's the only issue I have with what the Bible says. It's hard, right? Oh my gosh, is it hard? We have to fight against our own flesh because the tendency is to do the opposite, right? We want our own way. In the bottom of our hearts, we want our own way, don't we? Pride today is the most prevalent sin in the church today. And why is that? Because it manifests itself in so many different ways. And believe me, I need to hear this. I need to hear this more than anyone. I mean, believe me, it's, it's hard. Humility, gentleness, and patience is hard. Can I get an amen from all the parents out there? I know. Parents know this. Patience is hard. It's hard enough keeping unity within the home with people within our own family who live in our own home. But then you go ahead, you're in a church setting, you mix in a bunch of people who have different views on things and different attitudes on things and forget it, right? But yet God calls us to be of the same mind, the same heart, in unity with each other. We are to submit to one another in love. Unity takes humility and submission. But our pride wants to take the front seat, doesn't it? You know, our view is correct. We are in the right. That person or those people are on the wrong side of this issue. We take our stand and nothing's going to move us from it. This whole thing about masking during COVID, I think, you know, really brought out a bunch of issues that were, I believe, were really already there. <clears throat> are we going to let something like this or any other issue like this divide the unity that God has given us in Christ? I hope not. Like I mentioned earlier, all believers are united with each other, whether they know it or not, whether they like it or not. That's your position. Okay. We can even have legitimate disagreements with each other. That's fine, you know, about some subject. But don't let this lead you down the path of developing divisions and factions within the church. And maybe it's not, maybe it's not related to some style of preaching, but just rumors that spread throughout the church, you know, backbiting. Did you hear what so-and-so said about that issue or this, that issue? Did you hear what Pastor Jones thinks about social justice? Oh my gosh, I can't believe that. Or it could just be some difference of, of style again or on some, some other non-essential you know, doctrine. Maybe it's an issue of worship or music style. But what it ultimately boils down to is pride and selfishness. James 3.16 says this, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. And he goes on further in the next chapter, verses, chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, and he says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Don't they come? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and you covet, but you cannot have it. You quarrel and you fight. And you do not have because you do not ask God. And when you do ask, you don't receive it because you ask with the wrong motives that you would spend it on your own pleasures. Disunity with, and division within the church is like a cancer within the church. It grows and kills the church. And maybe disunity is actually better described as an autoimmune disease where the body attacks itself. Disunity and division in the church leads to destruction. We are meant to edify, to encourage, to build up the body, to build up one another, as Paul mentions later on in 1 Corinthians. Not to scorn, not to discourage or divide the body. Paul tells the Galatians over in Galatians 5.15, but if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another but rather in Philippians 2, verses 1 to 3. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if there's any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, 
maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing out of selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. He then in Philippians right after that goes on to describe how Christ had emptied himself and humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. I mean, if anyone had the right to claim superiority over the situation, it was Christ. How much more should we humble ourselves before others, given the forgiveness that we have been granted in Christ? Unity is grounded in the gospel. Unity is grounded in the gospel. We should be thinking of others more than ourselves and our needs and our wants. In another rebuke of the Corinthians, referring back to church, uh, chapter six, which I spoke about earlier, in that rebuke, they were suing each other. Christians within the church were suing each other. And ultimately, it's the same issue of divisiveness. But Paul says, why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? I mean, how are we as ambassadors of Christ, how are we adorning the doctrine of God if we're feuding against each other? Jesus says that they will know us by the love that we have for one another. Division and unforgiveness in the church mars the name of Christ. Not only does it not adorn the doctrine of Christ, it makes it look dreadful. He tells Titus, who Paul had left in Crete to select some elders and start the church there, that he should reject the factious man, the divisive man, in Titus 3, verses 10 and 11. For that man, he says, is condemning himself. He tells the Romans in Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause divisions and hindrances, contrary to the teaching to which you have learned and turn away from them, for they are not serving Christ our Lord, but their own appetites. Rather than that, Paul tells the, tells the Colossians in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. So as those who have been chosen by God, and again, you know, he's referring back to their position in Christ, they were chosen by God, passive. Holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Perfect bond of unity is love. So rather than strife and dissension, which disunity causes, the bond of Christian unity brings harmony, brings peace, it brings satisfaction, it brings blessing upon the church, and it brings proper worship. Why, why worship? Because that's what, the Lord, that's what the Lord desires of us, right? To worship him, for us to worship him as one voice and with one body. Now, over in Psalm 133, this is a psalm written by David. It's a relatively short psalm, so I'm going I'm to read the whole thing. <clears throat> Some of you might want to turn there. Psalm 133, I should have this marked beforehand. <laughs> psalm 133, it's called Blessed Unity of the People of God. And I believe it's one of the more descriptive sections of the Bible dealing with unity. It says, behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren who dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down to the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Mount Hermon, descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, live forevermore. David compares unity here with oil being poured over the head, flowing down over the body. He also compares it to the dew that's on Mount Hermon. 
And you can imagine, right? I mean, I think we have a pretty good idea of what Israel's like. It's a very hot, very arid climate. In fact, <clears throat> we just had a team that came back from Israel, went over there on a trip. Uh, Pastor James, Pastor Patrick was there. We had, I don't know, probably 16 or 17 of our members and several others, friends and relatives and so forth. They know what hot and arid is like. In fact, while they were over there, Israel was having a heat wave that it hadn't had in years. It was over 100 on multiple days that they were there. And actually, some of our members got heat stroke, had to go back to the hotel and rest. But you can imagine in this hot and arid climate, how oil must feel on the body. To us, it seems messy, right? I mean, just think about it. Pouring oil over your head, coming down through your hair, down over your body, on your clothes. It seems messy, right? But how soothing it must feel in that kind of climate. You know, water, you put it on your skin, it just evaporates, it goes away. But oil soothes, it stays, it doesn't evaporate, it soothes the skin. What a precious resource both oil and water are in that part of the world. John Piper says that this oil being poured symbolizes excessiveness, the excessive blessing of unity. Just think about it, over the head, down over the body, over the beard, down the robe. You know, it's not just like a little sprinkle. He's, he's pouring it on them. It's like the excessive blessing that we receive through unity. And even more than we deserve, the precious gift, even as a special oil that they reserve for the high priests. You know, it mentions Aaron in there, the oil that's poured over Aaron. Now, shortly before Jesus went to the cross, he prayed for unity among his followers. In the high priestly prayer, in the high priestly prayer, not pair, prayer. Prayer. Um, Jesus says this, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that we may be one, so that they may be one as we are one. And later on in that same prayer, Jesus asks that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. I have given them glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought into complete unity. <laughs> Obviously, Christian unity is important to our Lord. Jesus not only prayed for unity, but he also gave the reasons that Christian unity is important. He asked that all believers may be in the Father and the Son, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And then Jesus prayed for, prayed for complete unity in that same prayer, so that the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as I, even as you have loved me. When Christians are united in Christ, outsiders see that love. You know, it, it's different from the world. It's a deep, deep love and care for one another. The outsiders see that love we have, and it reflects the love that the Father and his Son have for us. So we're reflecting the love that the Father has given us. Over in Romans 15, 5, and 6, we see another more general reason why Christian unity is important. It says, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, ultimately, the bottom line of our lives and all that we do is to give glory to God. And that's what he's saying here. Now, in the, in the remainder of these verses, verses 4 to 15, let's just read those real quick again. In the remainder of these verses, basically, Paul is just trying to say that he didn't baptize these people. He says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides that, I don't know if I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. So basically he's saying that I didn't baptize anyone except for just a couple, right? And he's glad for this because 
that would have just meant to, would have led to more people lining up behind Paul as their leader. But he said, Christ did not send him to baptize. He sent him to preach the gospel. And that's what Paul was all about, spreading the message of the gospel, not himself. As John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease. That's what Paul was all about, giving the glory to God. And that's how we should approach things as well. The secret to unity begins with how we view ourselves within the body and how we view others. The key verse that addresses this is Philippians 2.3, which we've already gone over, but I want to go over it again because it's very important. Do nothing out of selfish ambition and conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourself. Disunity in a church is most often caused by pride. When we act selfishly and we consider ourselves better than others, let us not think more of ourselves than God's word does. That's important. Let us not think more of ourselves than God's word does. Christians are told to make out their lived out experience match the objective fact of who they are in Christ. Again, as Paul begins this letter of Corinthians, their practice should match their position. If Christians who are members of the same team see themselves in competition with one another, then, or in some sort of battle of superiority, they're not playing as teammates. They're not walking in the light of the unity that should exist among fellow believers, among fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. We're of one family here. The challenge of Christian unity is to live up to the truth of that reality. Since we are all members of one body, we need to live like it. This means subordinating your individual needs to the needs of the body and using your individual gifts for the edification of the whole body. Rather than elevating our own needs, our own wants, and our own preferences, you should lay down your life and serve the body. How are you guys doing in that? Hey, we're all, we're all sinners here, right? I mean, myself included, we're all sinners here. And when sinners come together, even within a church, you can expect at some point or another what? Conflict, right? Conflict's going to happen. We're, we're sinners. But we're forgiven sinners. And if not for God, you would still be a slave to your sin. You would still be dead in your sin. You have been, you have been forgiven an unpayable debt. You've been made alive. We have been raised from our old, dead, sinful self. Just like Lazarus, who was called out of the grave, so we are called out of the deadness of our sin to be made alive in Christ. If you're here today and you're not a believer, you can have that joy today. You can have the joy of being joined into unity with the body of Christ and the family of God to know that your eternal future is secure. I'm sure there's many people here today who would love to talk with you about this, so please take the time to do so. As we have seen today, unity is something that's very important to God our Father. It's all over his word. Let's make this a priority in this Christ church. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I'm so thankful, Lord, that you... You value oneness. As with you, your son, and the spirit, Lord, you are one. Let us be one as well. Let us think of each other as being of one family, of one mind, of brothers and sisters together. I pray, Lord, today that if someone here today has not considered coming to the Lord, coming to your son, I pray that you would convict them, convict their heart, so that they can be joined in unity with the body of believers here in Lighthouse LA. I'm thankful for this church, Lord. I'm thankful for the many members who serve here, for their diligence, for their perseverance. It's not easy, Lord. We understand that, but we know that you give us the strength and the power that we need through you, through your son and through the spirit. Thank you, Lord, for today. I pray that this church would be blessed and continue to grow and that your blessing will be upon it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.